Diving accidents are rarely fatal, and the risks of dying while diving are extremely remote. Additionally, deaths that occur during diving activities are rarely related to the dive itself. While medical histories of diving-related fatalities are usually incomplete or unavailable, the available data shows that many have chronic heart disease. The percentage changes every year, but nearly half of the divers have a history of high blood pressure or coronary artery disease at the time of the fatality. In many cases, these divers may have had actual cardiac events preceding the fatality, but the ultimate cause of death wasn't specifically tied to diving. It could just as well have happened on the golf course. To learn from diving fatalities, it is helpful to study the phases of the accident and understand and separate the disabling injury, the disabling agent, and the trigger leading to the fatality. The disabling injury is not necessarily the cause of death, but is ultimately responsible for death. The disabling agent causes the disabling injury, while the trigger is the event that starts the sequence of events that ultimately lead to a diver's death. The final cause of death in most dive fatalities is usually drowning, but the events leading to the drowning are much more important. An example of a triggering event could be a heart attack with the disabling agent being a loss of consciousness that eventually leads to drowning without intervention. Dan collects information and publishes reports on diving fatalities. Many valuable lessons and warnings are to be found in these reports. Consult your regional DAN office for information on receiving those reports. Although underlying medical conditions make up about half of the causes of diving deaths, diving skills, physical fitness, and experience are important to prevent the other half. Having recent experience with emergency skills is the best way to prevent a minor difficulty from becoming a life-threatening situation. Practice air sharing techniques, mask removal and replacement, and regulator retrieval skills during routine dives so you'll be prepared in the event you suddenly need those skills. Every diver is responsible for their own safety, but diving with a well-organized group may increase your safety margin. It is also a great way to gain experience and to offer a pool of responsible buddies and to obtain sound information on local conditions and hazards. Divers should be honest about telling their dive buddies about their skill and fitness levels. The cause of a diving fatality or serious accident is rarely known at the time of the body recovery or rescue attempt. Rescuers are often the last ones to learn what actually happened. Additionally, most rescuers in dive accidents are not professional rescuers. They are usually dive buddies or the dive crew on a dive boat. Most have not received training in dealing with the stress and aftermath of a rescue especially one without a happy ending. After the event is over and the body has been removed from the scene, the rescuers are usually left to deal with their own thoughts and speculations. Few are adequately prepared to deal with the situation. This is called critical incident stress, and it happens when a rescuer has trouble processing and moving beyond the things they see when performing a rescue. It only becomes a problem when it affects the rescuer's ability to do his job and causes loss of sleep that disrupts normal life. Other signs include having a hard time shutting down or constantly feeling on edge. Flashbacks of the incident may be very disturbing and the rescuer may start to avoid activities or places reminding them of the event. To manage this stress, there is a process called critical incident stress management. The key component of this process is the critical incident stress debriefing. A critical incident stress debriefing is not counseling or long-term care. It is designed to help people deal with their trauma one incident at a time. This debriefing is designed to be peer-delivered. That means by equals in a comfortable setting. Preferably, though, the facilitator shouldn't be a supervisor or even someone involved in the incident itself. 
To begin this process, the facilitator involves everyone in discussing the facts of the event and discusses the roles they assumed in the rescue. It is helpful for rescuers to discuss in detail what they saw, smelled, heard, and felt. It makes the experience come alive so that it can be interpreted and diffused. In the second phase of the debriefing, rescuers should share their feelings and discuss how the event made them feel. The facilitator should explain that whatever they are feeling is a natural reaction. What they think of as abnormal reactions are just normal reactions to abnormal situations. Some of these reactions include headaches, insomnia, flashbacks and anxiety, anger or depression. Some general recommendations on dealing with the stress of a rescue include to avoid using alcohol to cope with the event, to avoid isolating yourself from family or friends, to eat well, to get some exercise, to give yourself some time to heal, and to understand that the event should bother you initially. A critical incident stress debriefing should not take the place of professional care if a rescuer cannot move beyond the event. Dive fatalities are rare. Unfortunately, this makes investigating them that much more difficult. Local investigating authorities usually don't have a good understanding of the equipment and how it is used. A thorough investigation should include any past medical and social history for the diver. It should also include information about the dive site and the environmental conditions at the time of the accident. You should collect the dive profile and a detailed history of the accident and any resuscitation efforts. Finally, you should carefully examine the dive equipment, photographing it, and recording anything you can find about its condition. When gathering information on the dive accident itself, a great source obviously is a dive computer if the diver was wearing one. It's also a great idea to download the buddies profile and the dive masters as well on a guided dive. This can give you information about the dive plan and any alterations or changes the deceased may have made. When it comes to gathering information on the dive, you should try to establish when anyone last saw the diver, what he was doing, and was he responding normally at that time. It's also a good idea to interview and capture statements from any rescuers who may have offered aid to the diver and collect specifics on any resuscitation efforts. After an accident, you should immediately gather up the diver's equipment and secure it. Don't let anyone tamper with it. You'll need to maintain a strict chain of custody to make sure no one is able to tamper with it, or at least make sure there are no suspicions it has been tampered with. You should also take a thorough inventory of all the equipment and photograph everything. If at all possible, photograph the diver still in his gear. Resuscitation or recovery efforts may make this impossible, but if the possibility is there, it will be invaluable later on. You should also record the final tank pressure. If the diver was diving on mixed gases, it is also helpful to analyze their contents to make sure the tanks were marked and marked correctly. You should close the cylinder valve to prevent the gas from leaking out, then you should document that it was found in the open position if that was the case. Lastly, you should record the overall condition of the gear, checking to see if the BCD was inflated or filled with water, for example. There are some international differences with these recommendations, however. In Australia, for example, investigators do not want anyone to tamper with the equipment. You should check with local law enforcement to determine the best course of action. Even though it is well beyond this program, it is important to note that there should be a complete autopsy performed on any diver who dies in a dive accident. Often, medical examiners, without a good understanding of dive accidents, declare that divers simply drown without understanding what caused them to stop breathing while underwater. While it isn't your responsibility to obtain medical records or conduct the investigation, the investigators will look into any possible medical problems that could have led to the fatality. Specifically, the investigators will look for known allergies, including to marine animals, any medications the diver was taking, past illnesses and any breathing disorders that may compromise the diver's ability to function in the water or that could lead to air trapping on ascent. 
They will also look into more recent medical issues, including ear infections or colds, alcohol or drug use, or smoking. Another key set of questions investigators should know about includes the diver's training and experience level in the water. They will need to know if the diver was certified and certified in that particular type of diving. They will ask questions about the total number of dives or any similar dives in the past. When it comes to the dive site itself, the investigators will collect information on the water type, currents, temperatures, and winds. They will also need to know about any potential entanglements or conditions like caves or wrecks, along with bottom conditions like silt that could have caused a problem.